Hey everybody, what's going on and welcome to Guns N' Roses Central and today I want to talk about the incident that happened about a week or so after Guns N' Roses opened four shows for the Rolling Stones. So I've already done a true story episode on those four shows and everything and the controversy that happened around that time. So Guns N' Roses guitarist Slash and Steve Nadler were pretty deep in their heroin addiction at that time. So about a week after the shows happened with the Stones, uh, Doug Goldstein, who was working with Guns N' Roses at the time, he wasn't their full manager at the top, at that point in time yet. Alan Niven was still managing the band until 91, and that's when Doug Goldstein would become their manager. So he was still working with the band, and he had give, been given the task of taking Steven Adler and Slash to detox from drugs in Arizona. So their place where they were going to go detox was at an exclusive golfing resort. So turning up unannounced at Slash's house was now a familiar ritual for Doug Goldstein. So Goldstein would basically tell Slash, okay, you need a pair of shorts and a pair of shoes, and I'm going to have to look inside your shoes first, though, and I'm buying the smokes. Because what they used to do back was back in the day was hide a little bit of heroin inside balloons in the bottom of a pack of Marlboro. And towards the end, it was basically, I'm picking you up, and you're going to be naked, and I'm going to do the actual rectal search. So this time, though, with the trip to Arizona, Goldstein would have both Slash and Steven to try to deal with. And he said, I'm supposed to monitor them while they get clean, he recalls. So I got to my sleeping pills. So I go get my, I got my sleeping pills, and I'm going to administer to them. I pick up Steven, and I go to Slash's house, and somebody has tipped him off, right? So he's in the wind, nowhere to be found, but I said, F it, Steven, we're going. We get on a plane, and we're out there for about four days, and Stevie's sleeping till like 3 in the afternoon. So I said, look, I'm going to go play some golf in the morning. And Steven goes, yeah, yeah, I'll just sleep in. So I leave the hotel at like 5.30 in the morning and it's about maybe 8. And I make the first birdie of the day. It's hole number 9 and the marshal pulls up and says, is there a Goldstein in the group? You need to call your office right now. I call the office and Niven picks up and he goes, where the F are you? And I go, I'm golfing, why? Slash is on his way to jail. I go, you're in LA, go F and bail him out. He goes, he's in effing Arizona at your hotel, you dumbass. Unbeknownst to Goldstein, Stephen was unable to bear the gnawing pangs of heroin withdrawal any longer and had phoned Slash in LA the night before begging him to bring some junk and come out and we'll party here. Panicked, Goldstein jumped into his golf cart and drove as fast as he could back to the hotel. When he pulled up, he says, there's maybe 10 cop cars, an ambulance, a fire engine, and about 200 people all in a circle. Wading his way through the crowd, he saw Slash standing there stark naked and bloody, and I'm like, oh no, this ain't good. Slash goes, Dougie, I was in the shower, right? I looked through the keyhole and these guys were shooting guns at me, but they don't shoot bullets, they're shooting arrows. The arrows are going like ping, ping, bang. And then one of the cops standing next to Slash basically says, hey Slash, give him a physical description. Slash goes, okay. So the tall one, he was like four foot eight inches and he's wearing an ACDC shirt. He saw that through the keyhole, of course, right? I look at Earl Gabadon, who was Axel's bodyguard at the time, and go, do me a favor. Here's my room key. Go get the briefcase. And Doug at that time used to carry about $50,000 in cash everywhere he went just for situations like this. So Doug says to Slash, tell me what happened. He goes, so they're shooting arrows at me. So I said, F it, I'm going to kick their ass. So I broke through the shower door, broke through the bathroom door, and started counting the arrows in my head. Then these efforts outran me, but then some bitch comes up to me speaking in tongues, so I effing knocked her out and threw her to the ground. It turned out that girl was the maid. She was speaking Spanish to Slash. Now I've got my briefcase in my hand, and I see this guy in the crowd, and his shirt is bloody. I pull, I pull him to one, to one side and go, let me ask you a question. What did you see? He says, I saw everything. And then Doug said, you saw him hit the maid? He said, yep, I saw him hit the maid. I said, you know what? I can't help noticing you're wearing a monogram shirt. The guy goes, no, 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 no. My wife bought it at like some bargain place. And Doug said, look, I know what I'm doing. Don't tell me. That's an effing monogram shirt. That's a $2,000 shirt, right? So I give the guy two grand. So tell me again, what did you see? He goes, oh, oh, well, got it. I didn't see shit. So he walks away and then I go, where's the manager on duty? This guy goes, that's me. I go, have you looked at the room yet? He goes, yeah, I go, any idea of the damage yet? He goes, yeah, the room's going to be out of commission for about two days while we repair it. It's not that bad of damage, really. You're probably looking at, I don't know, two grand. I go, I'm sorry, did you say five grand? So I give him five grand for that. I ask him, how about the maid? What does she make? 
He says, maybe $600 a month. I go, so three grand will cover her? He goes, absolutely. Meanwhile, the cops are cracking up because they totally see what I'm doing. I look at the cops and I go, hey guys, I got a feeling if you look around the crowd, you're not going to find anybody who wants to testify against this guy anymore. They go, you know what? Get him out of here right now or I'll be back to do it for, for you. So in Slash's book, he tells a bit of a different story. So according to his book, he said, I caused quite a bit of commotion by then and the cops had arrived and along with a crowd of onlookers, they confronted me in my hiding place. I wasn't seeing the predators anymore, but when I gave the cops my testimony, it involved a detailed recreation of how they chased me all over the resort trying to kill me. I was still high enough that I told the story without a shred of self-consciousness. Everything around me still looked pretty bizarre, even when Stephen broke through the crowd and handed me a pair of sweatpants. The cops took me back to my room and found a bag full of syringes, but no drugs. And since I had a prescription for Buprinex, which did not get you high, I was allowed to have syringes and nothing seemed to miss. Still, the Arizona police weren't buying it, and at some point they left me in the room to discuss amongst themselves what to do with me. I was still convinced that everything I told them had happened, which didn't exonerate me. They kept staring at me like, okay. They eventually took me in. Once they found the coke residue and the spoon on the floor... But Doug stepped in and called Danny Zalisco, the high-powered promoter in Phoenix, who managed to keep me out of jail. Doug and Danny hustled me out of Phoenix, minus one shoe, because one of my feet was too far injured to wear one. They got me on a private jet and flew me the F out of there. And without Danny's help, I was looking at serious jail time. Thank you again. So Slash said when he landed back in LA, he was picked up and snuck into a suite at the Sunset Marquee. He said my speedball rally at the golf course had left me exhausted, so I went straight to sleep. I woke up to Duff standing over my bed saying, Hey man, you awake? Yeah, I said, trying to figure out exactly where I was. Get some clothes on. I'm going to wait for you in the other room. He said, I got to talk to you about something. Okay, cool. So I walked into the living room and every seat in the place was full. My managers, my mom, and my bandmates, except for Izzy and Axel, aside from my drug dealer, almost everyone I knew was there. It was an official intervention. I was still getting my bearings, but I ultimately thought that it was ridiculous that Steven was there because he had needed rehab just as much as I did, if not more. I stared at him just thinking, hypocrite. Everyone else in attendance meant something more to me. It's not quite sure. I'm not sure quite quite sure what, but definitely something. Almost everyone there had something to say. My security guard Earl said, Slash, you were vibrant and alive in Chicago. In Chicago, you were so strong. I can't see, stand to see you like this in this weak condition. My mom was stupefied. She sat there in silence for the most part, and Alan Niven was typically bombastic. He said, Slash, you have to go to rehab, he said. It's all been arranged. They all said that they love me and God bless their hearts. I'm sure they meant it, but being confronted that way was so heavy that it lost something about they lost something in translation. I was completely cornered, so my usual bullshit lines about being fine were not going to work. I was stuck with no defense and I was guilty without a trial and there was nothing I could do. Like anyone in that situation, my lying had come into harsh focus. I never blamed my mom for any of this, and I never for a moment thought that this was her idea. She looked as confused as I did that day, and the rest of them were scheming mother effers as far as I was concerned. Regardless, if I was going to make it right with the band, I'd have to go to some clinic in Tucson called Sierra Tucson, so I entered rehab for the first time. The thing about rehab is that you have to want it. When you do, it works wonders, but when you don't, it may clean out your body, but it won't change your mind. This is precisely what happened to me my first time. I went through detox. It was very secure in a very sterile environment, but there was no way in hell that I intended to take part in any aspect of clean living community that is phase two of rehab. But before I got there, I did what every dedicated junkie does. I told everyone at my intervention that I agreed with them, that I intended to go along with their plan for me. So as long as I could spend one last night uh, in my bed before I clean up, uh, before I set off to clean up in the morning, they said, okay, because my shenanigans had run their course as far as they were concerned. He said, I went back to my house, retrieved my stash, did my fix, and hung out with Megan, who was completely unaware of this entire event going down. So he had told Megan that he had basically went to Arizona to uh, take care of some band business instead of actually detoxing. I told her that I'd be away for a while on band business, and the morning I got up bright and early, fixed again, and got into the limo with Doug to go to Tucson. The place was in the middle of the desert in, in, in every way. There were no markets, no housing developments, strip malls, and nothing civilized was within miles. It was a little sober oasis. He said, I was checked into a two-bedroom uh, room, but never had a roommate for the duration of my stay, which was great. The first three or four days of drying out were typically awful, though they were made less drastic due to the combination of medications I was given. I never kicked that way, so it was a welcome relief, but nothing quite so comfortable that I could eat or sleep anything soundly for more than a half hour or two at a time. After a few days, once the sweats and anxiety and inescapable discomfort receded, I was comfortable enough in my own skin to get out of the bed and walk around a bit. It was all that I could do. I wasn't ready for human interaction at all, but the moment I emerged from my room, the staff was all over me and, and to attend group therapy. 
So Slash said he did his best to avoid attending the group therapy because he really didn't want to see other people. But he said, most of the people I met there had multiple addictions and personalities so complex that they defied all of my preconceived notions. They were a strange collection of individuals from all walks of life. It was just like one flew over the cuckoo's nest and like Jack Nicholson's character. I was convinced that I had least effed up. I was least effed up of all of them. I was operating under the impression that I knew what I was doing uh, when I was doing it, no matter what it was. Uh, while these people didn't seem to know what they were doing at any moment ever and had no idea what they'd done to get here. After another three or four days, that was it. I said, F this. I was sick of rehab on every level from the staff encouraging me into group sharing and whatever might come from that to the two fast friends I met while smoking that wanted to meet up outside to score drugs together when they got out in a few weeks. So here's an interview that Slash gave in 1995 talking about this time in his life and how he really kicked his drug habit. So that does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to hit the like button if you enjoyed that video, and be sure to subscribe if you love GNR as much as I do. Also, go check us out on GNRcentral.com for the latest Guns N' Roses news. Take care.